Hello and welcome to Art of Law. And we have a special guest for everyone today, Mr. Dan Shensmith, who some of you may know as the Black Belt Barrister. And I suspect far more of you know who Black Belt Barrister is than I am. So thank you just for watching this. Um, yeah, Dan um, sort of has put up a fantastic video about the, um, the, the book, the, the, the Royals book, Naming Names. Um, and he was very kind enough to ask for my input. But bear in mind, pretty much the only thing I know about this story is from what I've got from Dan's videos. Um, I'll do my best. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to go over too much, repeat what Dan said, because um, there's a little phrase we use in the law, actually, when we're being lazy. And um, we stand up and we say, I adopt the submissions of my learned friend. And then we sit down, which just stops us all rambling on again. But yeah, I mean, just just to summarise, it's an interesting one because, I mean, first of all, there's this idea, you know, that the names got in there by accident as a mistranslation, although it seems very hard how you would mistranslate the names not being in there to, to, to two people's real names suddenly appearing. And you'll notice I'm very careful not to name names myself. But yeah, I mean, um, Piers Morgan has a, a, a number of defences. I mean, we've seen in the press, oh, the royals are consulting their lawyers. Well, of course, they have lawyers on tap, so they, they will have mentioned this to them. But, um, you know, prediction, this isn't going anywhere. Um, for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, what actually is the defamatory statement? Well, presumably, it's the, it's the accusation of racism. And this is something I want to come on to. So to add some value and some content, because Mr. Lawrence Fox is in a very similar and interesting predicament at the moment. Um, so I'd like to talk about that. But yeah, in, in Piers Morgan generally, well, first of all, something to point out is it's not a defence to a defamation claim to say, I'm repeating the allegation, but I'm saying I find it is nonsense. Um, because you are still repeating the claim in the same way that you can't go around saying, oh, it's uh, Mr. So-and-so has allegedly done something. Um, you know, doing the old quotes allegedly is not a defence because you are putting the story out there. However, in order to sue for defamation, you have to show serious harm. And you have to show the serious harm specifically from that defamatory statement. And what would be very hard here is, because the story is out in the press anyway, and Piers Morgan has just sort of, you know, commented on the story. Now, it's interesting here, because the argument would be, ah, yes, but there's additional harm caused specifically from your comments and your statement. So we can identify and allocate this particular bit of loss on you. And the interesting thing there, of course, is um, that you'd be arguing that Piers Morgan is a massively influential journalist and with a massive outreach. And it'd be interesting because that's something that journalists tend not to deny. I mean, I've mentioned the old defamation trick about ringing the uh, newspaper's advertising department and saying how much would, you know, if we were to put an advert in of this particular size on this page, in other words, the offending article. Um, how many people would see it. And the marketing departments always say, oh, tens of hundreds of thousands of people would see it. We sell millions of copies and they're all read by 27 people each. And you say, oh, that's great. Can you just stick that in an email, please? And then when the newspaper's arguing, trying to reduce the element of publication, oh, it did not that many people saw it, you say, well, that's not what your marketing department said. So I think poor peers would probably be an interesting one, that, because be, if this went to trial, which it won't, a great cross-examination question would be, Mr. Piers Morgan, you are a massive, you're probably the country's most influential journalist, aren't you? You've got the massive outreach. You know, what, what would he say about that? But yeah, so then first of all, they'd have to show serious harm flowing specifically from what Piers Morgan did. And so if you just pause then, there, then let the... me say what I said and put that to you, Al, and see what you would say to that. So I felt fairly comfortable saying in my video... I, I think Piers is in no trouble whatsoever because the way, although it's no uh, strict defence to just say you don't believe the allegation, hmm. I don't feel that he's in any trouble at all because of just how forceful his views are that he is, well, for one, supportive of the royal family in general, always has been, and two, very critical and very vocal about everything that both Harry and Meghan have ever said and uh, anything that's ever flowed from that. And obviously, when he has named them, he's done it in such a way 
that he's made absolutely clear that he thinks these allegations are, are rubbish, they're unfounded, baseless, uh, and everything else. So whilst it's not strictly a defence to say that you don't believe them, I felt comfortable in saying that. What are your views on that particular point? Absolutely. Because the story is already out there, this is comment. Um, we used to call it fair comment, and that, uh, now it's called opinion, even though it's the same thing. Um, he's, he's commenting and giving his opinion on a matter, and it's also, it's, uh, he's got a public interest defence. I mean, the story is out there. If he'd been the person to break the story, hey, this book has named these two people, and I think that's an outrage. And it was like, well, I didn't even know those two people were until you said it. That would be a different perspective. But now he's saying, look, the story is out there. Now, if it wasn't for the fact that I'm all tied up with cables, I would just reach over and get my copy of Spycatcher because I remember all the fuss about that back in the day. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, Morgan is absolutely safe on this because, um, you know, I mean, the only thing that might put pressure is he likes having access to the royals and the great and the good. So there could be some social pressure there. Oh, Mr. Morgan, if you don't sort of wind your neck in, you won't be getting any more invites. That's the sort of pressure that often works with journalists, is just being, you know, losing access. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely fine from a legal perspective, because like, like you're saying, Dan, I mean, he stands up in court and says, well, the story's already out there. I am saying it's rubbish. So, you know, how can that possibly, you know, cause a risk of more serious harm. So I think, yeah, he's, 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 per he's perfectly safe in what... And very much the public interest element, which is, um, obviously I said fair comment, which is now opinion, but also the public interest element, which is another thing I said in my video, because this is a public interest thing. This is, you know, this is the royal family. And, you know, whilst not everybody is supportive of the royal family, many people are. I would like to say most people are. And those that are, are very supportive of the royal family and would hate uh, for anything to besmirch the, the royal family's name. Yeah. And so this is a very unique situation, isn't it? This isn't just public interest. This is the, the pinnacle of public interest for the whole country, for the country's royal family, is it not? Absolutely. I mean, obviously, if you were for the claimant here, you would be doing the cliche of what, you know, public interest is not synonymous with what is of interest to the public because yeah. this is just scurrilous gossip. But I think, yeah, the fact that the people in the book have positions of power and influence and therefore yes. an examination of their attitudes and views is p perfectly the public interest. People though, remember the public interest test, there's two parts to it. Is the revelation in the public interest and was it in the public interest to reveal it at that specific time because the second mm. limb sometimes catches a few people out um, but in this particular case I, I don't think it's going to make any difference because the story's out there everybody's talking about it courts are very aware um, the reason I was going to go for spy catcher is that was the first time really that the courts addressed the issue of look we can control what happens in this jurisdiction but, you know, what can we control? You know, somebody could, you know, order this off an Australian bookseller tomorrow and read it, you know, because it's not like customs mm. are going to seize it. And now with yeah. the internet, I mean, you know, this has to be a factor that... OK, I mean, this does happen. I mean, the courts will make injunctions saying you cannot repeat this in the jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. um, even if you say, well, it doesn't matter because anybody can go on the internet. And there is this idea, because injunctions are equitable remedies. They say equity will not act in vain. In other words, unlike the common law, where you can go along and say, I want my piece of paper uh, saying this particular situation that, you know, somebody owes me some money. Even if it's absolutely useless and worthless, you're still entitled to the piece of paper. And a lot of judgments are absolutely useless and worthless. So the courts will go, and sometimes they will say, I don't know why people are bothering with this, because you're not going to get any practical benefit. And it's like, yeah, but I still want my piece of paper, which you're entitled to. Whereas equitable remedies, they go, no, the whole point of equity is it's to an address... An injustice. It's it's not strict and formal like the fo the common law. That was the whole point of having equity. Is it's a lot yeah. more flexible. To but in doing that, it's like, yeah, but you know, there's no there's no gap to be filled here. So, uh, courts they, they've moved on. Sometimes they will make injunctions and say we are making a worldwide injunction, even though it, an, an injunction in rem as opposed to in personam as we call them, uh, to use a bit of Latin that we're not supposed to. But yeah, even though abroad it might not have any effect whatsoever. It's one of the few times courts will make injunctions that are completely pointless. 
Um, but no, nothing's going to cover this. I mean, the interesting thing is the actual allegation itself, because it's effectively an allegation of racism. Um, and, you know, we have to separate this from racism and being a racist, because arguably they are two separate things. You know, oh, that was racist. You know, that you can, or even you can say that was a racist thing to do, but we're not saying you specifically are a racist. And this is something that's come up very interestingly with the Lawrence Fox case. <clears throat> And I do think he had a good argument for a jury there. Because just to sort of say what, you know, without going into too many details, Lawrence Fox, basically, um, he was on on air and he, he made some accusations against, you know, certain people uh, because they, they, had, they had called him a racist. Um, they had said he was a racist. And he made certain accusations against them. Uh, more to sort of go, it's not very nice being accused of things, is it? Now, they are suing him on those... Um, allegations, but he's counterclaiming in defamation for being called a racist. But his point is this: we're all very, you know, do a lot of training now at both bench and bar on equal treatment. Um, I just did my unconscious bias training the other day, which was absolutely brilliant. I have to say, I might do a video on it because it's really interesting with a really brilliant person presenting it. But judges have something called the equal treatment bench book, and that discusses racism. What is racism? And that adopts the what we call the Lawrence test after the Stephen Lawrence case, which is uh, something can be assessed as racist if anybody would perceive it to be racist. It's what we call an outcome thing. Uh, and it doesn't look at the intention. Intent is not magic, as we say. What the bench book says is, with the best will in the world, people might be actively trying to avoid being racist, but there could still be a racist outcome. I mean, it all gets to, you know, it's all quite interesting to actually read. Now, what Lawrence Fox's argument is, well, hang on, your hands are now tied because you are reading a book that says you have to, if anybody says somebody's a racist, you have to agree with them. And therefore, by definition, I can't defend myself. And that's why I was saying I want a jury because, you know, a jury's view of what amounts to racism might differ from what the bench book says. Uh, and like I say, you know, it's always been this idea that, that calling somebody a racist, if it's just a bear calling somebody, you know, so-and-so is a racist, that could be defamatory uh, because it's a statement of fact. But if you say so-and-so is a racist because he's done X, Y, and Z, then that becomes the opinion because opinion is where you base your comments on some facts. And the test is... Um, you have to base it on facts and you have to identify what the facts are. You'd have to go into great detail about it, but you'd have to say something like, in this, you know, they are accused of sort of commenting on somebody's skin colour or something like that. I, I think that's racist. So the test is, you have to base it on facts. It has to be an opinion that a reasonable person could hold. Not, not saying that they would hold it. It's not like, oh, everybody would agree with you, but it's something, yeah, okay, somebody, yeah, I can see other people might form that. And actually, one of people sometimes forget is you have to honestly have that opinion. I mean, usually that's not an issue, but it could be because, say, for instance, you know, I just wanted to, to sort of like, you know, be really horrible about somebody. I could say, well, in my opinion, they're X, Y, and Z based on these facts. I don't actually, I don't actually think that. But it is an opinion that some people could come to, even if I didn't. That wouldn't be a defence for me. Although it's always very hard to prove that people don't actually believe it themselves. But yeah, so that's so it would be very interesting because if this was to go to court, which it won't, um, you'd say, well, this is opinion anyway. You know, this is opinion because I think what they did amounts to racism. But of course you're basing it on the the facts, and it's how, can you prove those facts? That's that's where it becomes interesting. And it's, it, you know, this cropped up in the Cadwaller case, which is, is there enough information there that you could honestly believe those facts were true? And what caught her out is when the factual basis changed, she didn't update her comments. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's an interesting one. I mean, theoretically, you would have to prove that, you know, the underlying allegation is true, that people made those comments. But if you addressed it on the... If you were careful, and Morgan is very careful, because he's, you know, he's a very experienced journalist and he's had plenty of run-ins in the defamation courts in the past and indeed the contempt, so he knows what... You know, <laughs> you know he, this is not his first rodeo. He was like, yeah, yeah. if this is true, then, you know, this is outrageous. Because, I mean, he's not commenting on the allegation. He's dismissing them entirely. Um, and things, but he, he, I'd, I've not watched it, but if he was to say, 
even if this is true, which I don't believe, it still doesn't amount to. I mean, if, you know, that's the other thing, because it's, is he challenging the conclusion or is he challenging the underlying facts and said it never happened? Uh, because that, you know, that, that, that's, where, that's an interesting one. I mean, the trouble here is, of course, it's, it's evidence. I mean, the royal family do not get embroiled in personal litigation. I mean, it's a long time since a royal was in court, you know, if you don't in include Harry and, uh, and William's settlement. I mean, it was, it was all about somebody cheating. Actually, it was a defamation case. It was an allegation of cheating at a game of cards. And the Prince of Wales of the time uh, ended up being a witness in court, and it was considered to be quite scandalous. Um, you know, that the royals were sullying themselves and washing, you know, being there while people were washing their dirty linen in public. But yeah, so, I mean, it's an interesting one, like I say. I'm watching the Lawrence Fox case with quite some interest because I did think he had a genuine punt at getting a jury on that one. Um, but what the judge has said in that one is, um, actually, no, because... Since judges replace juries, and I keep saying this, in defamation, it's the one area where we're told, don't think like lawyers. Don't think like lawyers. Think like normal people. Um, so the judge is saying, oh, well, yes, this is the equal treatment bench book. So, yes, I would address everybody properly and courteously in court. And if somebody complained to me that, you know, one of the security guards has been racist, I'd be take it very seriously. But when assessing whether 12 good men and true would think you were racist, I will put myself in that view and say, well, actually, your average member of the public might not agree with the defini definition in the judicial treatment, uh, equal treatment bench book. So that's what I expect you saying. And judges are expected to do these sorts of mental gymnastics all the time. You know, it's like, we'll do something where we'll argue in a civil case and say, we want all this evidence excluded because it's prejudicial or irrelevant or something. And the judge will exclude it. But then we'll have that judge for the trial. <laughs> but, but the judge will, judges are very good at going, actually, you, you know, it's clear that this is the, if all that evidence had gone in, this would have been the result, but that evidence is inadmissible. So this is the result. Um, so, yeah. Um, it, 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 it's a storm in a teacup. It's interesting. It's great. But we are not going to see any legal action against Beers Morgan whatsoever, is my prediction. Inter interesting. And that's exactly what I thought. So I thought it'd be interesting to get your views on this as well. Um, <laughs> although, I'm, although I'm the guest, I'm going to say make sure you do subscribe because we are on Art of Law here. Oh, yeah. So make sure you subscribe. Um, Al always forgets to say it is too polite to say sometimes. But there we go. Hope you found that interesting. And um, it's... it's uh, your show, Al. <laughs> Any final thoughts? <laughs> no, 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 thank you. I'm glad. That, thank you for listening. Because, like I say, when I saw Dan's video, Dan said, "Oh, do you want to do something back of this?" And I went, "Well, what? Just say, yeah, you got it right." <laughs> but, but, but lawyers can always do this. If you say to lawyers, "I need you to rub it on for time," the one thing lawyers can do is, is is find words to fill space. So that, yeah. So there you go. But but I hope you did find that sort of, as always, vaguely interesting and vaguely useful. Um, but there you go. So, yeah, I mean, if you want actual devil in the detail stuff, go back and watch Dan's video because uh, you do your big <laughs> forensic breakdown of it. And, and you've actually seen the original story and you actually know who I've all these people are. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, as always, fascinating. And um, let's do this again. And we'll all see you next time. See you next time. <laughs>